and our first speaker this afternoon is going to be Stefan Bruskat, who's going to be talking to us about the citation file format. So please, when you're ready, take it away. Thanks very much indeed. Great to see you all. Hope you've had a, have a, had a good lunch. Um, yeah, I'm Stefan. I'm a doctoral researcher at the German Aerospace Center and Humboldt University in Berlin. And I will indeed present a sequel to my 2018 RSECON talk about the citation file format. But don't worry, it's a self-enclosed thing. You don't have to have watched the first one. So, um, Growing up to enable better software citation. Um, that's what I thought would be a good talk because the citation file format has come quite a long way. I'm going to talk briefly about what it is, what it tries to solve, what it tries to do, and then uh, we'll show you some of the newer integrations that have popped up uh, since last year. And finally, and this is probably the one the part of the talk I'm looking most, most forward to, is I'm going to show you how things are, how, how the CFF files are actually used or not used or used wrongly or created wrongly, etc., or correctly in the wild. So, the citation file format um, is a file format for citation information, surprisingly. Uh, for software citation information, more precisely. And um, taking one step back, um, why should we care about making our software citable in the first place? Um, that's because software, as we all know, is an important output of research. Um, and it also helps us to get credit for our work rather than having to write papers every time we, we finish or uh, re release a piece of software. It also helps the findability, accessibility, and reusability of software just by making clear what software has been used in other research so we can learn from them and kind of try and pick up software packages that have been used um, in different use cases. And reproducibility, uh, for that, software citation is a good entry point because unless you know what software has been used for a specific piece of research, you wouldn't be able to kind of reproduce the results, right? Um, the most important theoretical foundation of this work is a paper from 2016 um, called the Software Citation Principles. And um, it basically lays out the six principles of software citation. So do cite software like you would a paper. Um, make sure that citation enables credit and attribution of the authors. Um, make sure that citation includes unique identification of the software that has been used in the work. Make sure that software is Per, uh, accessed in a way where you can get, get to a persistent record of the software, uh, make sure that you include a persistent identifier in the citation. Um, software citation should also enable access to the software itself. That's obviously very important. And be specific about what software you have used in your work so that other people can reproduce, retrace your steps towards research results. So the problem that the citation file format tries to solve is that there is no title page for software. Meaning that um, reading about something or looking at software, we have no name. We may have no, no idea what the, what the actual name of the software is. It could be analysis.py, and probably that's not a very specific name for a piece of software. We probably have no idea who the authors are as compared to perhaps the contributors or committers. If we look at the GitHub or, or GitLab repository, but th those two can be completely different from each other. We may have no idea what the version is, if there is versioning at all. Um, the publisher, etc. All this information is not easily found. So what the citation file format set out to do is to make it possible for people that create software to provide this information because they are the only people that can actually do so. They're the, the only people that can say, we have uh, people on our team who have contributed to the software, but they haven't you know, pushed anything to GitHub, but they're still authors of the software. That's what I mean by authoritative. So it's an authoritative uh, format, big word. Um, it also makes the citation metadata controllable for the software authors because they can supply it. They can provide it together with the source code in the repository. And we have created the citation file format so that it is as principled as possible. It tries to cater towards the software citation principles. It tries to make sure that software is actually seen as the important output it is. Uh, make sure that credit and attribution is possible. Um, make sure that you can but you don't have to provide unique identification if, if you have that for the software. You know, provide a link to a persistent version of the software, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the CFF format is implemented in YAML, which is hopefully something that some people will be used to in terms of having, having written config files, et cetera. Um, it is basically a 
simple key value structure where values can also be lists and arrays and objects itself. Um, um, in the latest version, and this is a, this is an example file which gives just a probably what we call a, a good practice example rather than the minimal example of things you want to have in there. So you can see the list of authors, you can see the title of the software, you can see the release date. There is an array of identifiers, you have a license information, repository code information, and the version, of course. And we have, in the latest version of CFF, introduced some new things, um, namely a preferred citation field, which is actually not something that we suggest people really use because that gives you the opportunity to put in citation information for a paper describing the software. We made sure that this is a kind of second level field so that you always have to put in at least the minimal metadata for the software itself because that's what you want people to cite. That's the actual output. It's not the paper, it's the software. Um, you can provide reference information in CFF and that's because we think that if we want to treat software as a first class, first class citizen, um, uh, you know, a proper research output, then they should work the same way as papers do. And papers say, this is the work that we, we're building on. And obviously software is work that builds on other work, namely, you know, it's the dependencies it could be papers about describing algorithms, etc. So the references section is meant for that. Uh, we also included data set support, which is very experimental. We don't say that this is something that should actually be done uh, in practice, because there are probably better metadata formats for data sets. And uh, CFF really caters for software mostly. <clears throat> The project itself started at Wispy in 2017, and some of the people that have been part of the original discussion group are in the room. Great to see. Um, we think about it as a community project. It has had contributions from the wider community. Main development work has been done at my institution at the Netherlands East Science Center and via Rob Haynes at the University of Manchester. It's openly developed. We use open licenses exclusively. And we do collaborate with other groups. We talk to people in the Code Meta project, for example. We talk to people or are part of the group that is the Force 11 Software Citation Implementation Working Group, which tries to implement the software citation principles in practice. Um, we do have a dedicated section for software citation and CFF in a Turing way. Um, and we are in the process of developing a more formal governance for the CFF as a project. Um, and we started to do so with help from the Code for Science and Society digital infrastructure incubator and they gave us a grant that was great to give you an idea where cff sits in the well it's it's a very small ecosystem that's depicted here but um in in comparison to code meta specifically and BitTech, um citation file format really cares about software metadata metadata for software whereas you can describe different other things as you know with BitTech, and also just the citation metadata as compared to code meta where you can describe many more things Um, it's also more than just a format. Um, specifically, this thing is something that the Netherlands Sea Science Center built. It's a, we call it CFF init. It's an initializer. It's a web form, basically. We can put in manually all the information that you want to go in the CFF file, and you can then just download and put it in your repository. Um, and one of the things I'll talk about in a minute is, does this actually work? Do people actually use this? Does this help the validity of the files? Um, we have different tools for working with CFF, for you know, creating the files in the first place, for editing them, updating them, validating them, and converting them to other formats, such as called Meta, Zenodo, JSON, RIS, BibTech, etc., in a variety of languages and um, tool formats, I suppose. There is a long list, or a, a relatively long list of tools, or a table, horrible format, uh, of tools on the on the website. You can follow follow this link and find it. Now. Um, as a community project, I've, I think we've seen uptake uh, and up, up to 500 files on GitHub in 2018, and we thought that was really good, and it was. And then last year, um, GitHub decided to support CFF to provide citation information for software uh, via CFF, and that's that's uh, that's been a game changer, <laughs> say the least. Um, so what GitHub does is via Rob's um, Ruby CFF gem. Thank you for that. Um, it takes this, it detects the CFF file. It takes the metadata information. It, it converts it into a string, either in APA format or as BibTeX, and it's being displayed in this nice widget on the website. And that's great. It, you can also, there is some support for creating new files. So if you create a citation.cff file, 
via the GitHub UI, you get a template that you can fill in. Uh, there is documentation on GitHub itself as well, and that's really been the, um, the most important change um, for CFF in the last year. Um, just after the GitHub support was announced, Zenodo came forward and said, we also do this. So instead of having to use the pull-based mechanism um, that the GitHub Zenodo integration supplies, you can say, I put a CFF file in my repository, and then I automatically have it publish to Zenodo, create a Zenodo record based on a release I do on GitHub, and the information in the CFF file will be used instead of the um, less reliable, say, information that Zenodo has pulled in the past from the GitHub repository. And you can see that as a very, very simple example. Uh, if you supply a title, you actually get the title on the record. If this is, well, you may get a user handle. This is the actual username, and you've got an ORCID ID, and different other things. And this is just a very small example. Um, CFF is supported by some of the reference managers. So if you, if you use Zotero and you have this wee browser button, you can click on any page. If you click on the GitHub page, the information from the CFF file is going to be pulled into Zotero, which is great. And if you have a citation CFF file uh, that you find somewhere in your software, you can import it into Jabrev as well. And we have taken care to provide a JSON schema for the format with the last published version, which is one, uh, 120. So that means that as RSEs, we can create a file in, your, in our IDE. And if the IDE supports JSON schemas, then we have uh, things like auto-completion and validation. Um, and I think that's a great thing. And it'll hopefully greatly help people to create valid CFF files. So um, I was really interested to see now that we have quite a number of files uh, on GitHub to see how people actually use them. And so I've tried to drill um, into a corpus of files. And I didn't quite get to the point where I learned how, how, what they use it for, but I could at least see some of the, some of the issues. So I'm going to share some preliminary results, but to start off, if the GitHub search API is right, um, against which I run a query every single day at the moment, as, well, as of yesterday, there are around 11,000 files on GitHub and that's a suspiciously linear growth. So there might be something wrong. But you can see, see. I mean, the original graph looks looks like a, a mohawk uh, haircut because you have the issues in the well. But when there was working going on the back end of GitHub, then you don't get reliable search results. So um, this is an approximation, I guess. So uh, the first thing in trying to understand um, what what CFF is in the wild, um, we ran a. A session at the at the collaborations workshop hack day this year where a great bunch of people came together and tried to pull as many cff files from github as possible github by the way because it's the only platform we can actually find cff files we have a way of finding them um gitlab.com unfortunately that's not possible i hope it would be um and we managed to retrieve around 3000 files which is already not bad um we looked at different things like uh, has the CFF file version information? Does it have a code repo URL for accessibility of the software? Does it have a DOI preferred citation? And we came up with a number of 1.6% of files being compliant on GitHub. And that made me suspicious. And I think, I'm not quite sure, I need to go back and look at the data. I think we have a different idea of what compliant actually is. I think we looked at being compliant with the software citation principles. And 1.6% is not very good, but also um, software publication to achieve the implementation of the software citation principles for your own software is really hard. And we're trying to change that in a different project, Hermes. We're going to run a workshop tomorrow. If you're interested, come, come see us in the morning. Um, but then thankfully, um, Dan introduced me, Dan Katz introduced me to some people at GitHub Policy and they gave me 7,000 URLs for Git, uh, CFF files. And so I went and kind of deduplicated these URLs we had, built a wee corpus and ran some analyses. And um, I think it was an Australian rock band that said, it's a long way to the shop if you want a sausage roll. This is the long and stony road to validity of CFF files. Um, I had a num around about 7.5,000 7 URLs, of which around 770 were irretrievable. I could just couldn't get the files. 
so I, I ended up with around 7,000 files that I could actually have on my hard drive. And I, first of all, I had to check whether these are text files or something else. And we had one open document text file. So somebody fired up LibreOffice and put in CFF. Uh, but apart from this one thing, everything else is a text file. That's a good start. Then I had to look at is the the text in the in the file actually valid YAML? And yeah, most of it is. I mean, 300 invalid YAML files, not bad. You, you, have, you have tabs, you have uh, different indenting problems, et cetera, et cetera. So in the end, we ended up with 6,609 valid YAML files. And then I ran proper validation via the CFF convert tool that we have in the CFF project. And it turned out that around 62% of the retrievable files are actually valid CFF. And taking that this is a text format that we have talked about in the past as being human writable, this is not a bad number, I think, because there's still a, ma a number of things that can go wrong if you write such a file by hand. So in the end, 4,300 valid CFF files, um, it's not bad, it's good. But I tried to understand what the actual issues with the invalid files were. Um, but first, kind of, and this is this is probably a good idea, a good good example of trying to um, figure out what impact your work has had. Is we try to look at or try and try and see if there was correlation between people using the web form for CFF creation and the validity of files. And only ten percent of the files were created with CFF in it. We can we know because there is a comment being put into the CFF file by the tool that says, this file has been created with CFF in it. If you want to use it as well, go to this URL. So it's just looking for, for that string, uh, around 10%, which still for a tool that isn't widely publicized yet, um, I think that's not bad. But also we've seen that, um, yeah, okay, CFF in it only works with version 102, uh, 120 as well. So it's, it's that part of the data set. And if you kind of track invalid files, um, so files with errors, and these would be the oranges or the bars on the right-hand side, you can see this is probably two-thirds of them, and then you're up to over half of them are invalid. And now we're down to um, which is something like a fifth or something, fourth um, of the whole thing. So we still have uh, 1,300 files that are invalid um, or have errors, but only 56 of them have been created with CFF in it. And hopefully that goes to show that people have put this tool to use and created valid CFF files. Uh, two people managed to create the valid CFF file and then botch it up in the end. So um, this is just in the invalid CFF version, I think. Yeah. Um, the next thing I was looking at is looking at the files that have errors, validation errors, so that are, are, are invalid CFF. Um, I found. 2,600 files, and the total number of errors, because one file have, can, can have more than one error, is around 4,000. Um, 2,000 of which I couldn't map yet to um, a taxonomy of error types and levels, because I just didn't get around to doing it. Uh, this is stuff that's coming from the JSON schema Python validation tool. So that was work of tr trying to parse error messages and then mapping them to a taxonomy of, yeah, of uh, error types. Um, a lot of people get required fields wrong, so they don't, just don't put them in. Um, or use uh, values for something that should come from a defined list of values. Um, so I try to look at specifically the fields that people don't put in, although they should be there. And there is, at the top level of CFF, there's four required fields that you have to put in. It's CFF version, which is a bit weird. It's, it's a meta field in a way, because that says this file is in CFF version one two zero, and you have have to have an author's field because you know you want credit. You have to have a message with a specific. It's something that is used in CFF to describe what people are looking at. So this say, says something like, if you use have used the software in your research, please cite it using these metadata. Um, and then the title. And I found that a lot of people have an issue with CFF version. So files don't just don't have this value. Um, authors same thing and message um also quite a number of files and um, there were a few files in references um that didn't have required fields but um these are diffi more difficult types i suppose so what what have we learned um i think 
I hope to have seen in the in the data that CFF in it is actually a good thing and people use tooling and tooling can help them create valid files. Um, there seem to be issues around require fields and enums, so perhaps we have to look at uh, improving documentation, perhaps building new tooling, improving existing tooling, um, and also make just making the tooling that is there more visible, more usable, etc. So people go back there, use the tooling, and create valid files. Um, the general take-home message from all of these talks about CFF is please go back, create a file for your software, put it in your repository, and Make sure you validate it, perhaps, if you can, or use CFF in it to create it. In the first place, you can have a valid file. Um, take home message from me is I really want to drill deeper into this data. And with that, I'm finished. Thank you very much for listening. Perfect timing. Thank you very much, Stefan. So we have time for a few questions, and there are some on Slido. OK, so first question is from Anonymous saying, uh, do we have a way to validate our CFFs easily, perhaps a GitHub action to make it easier? Yes, we do. There is a validation tool. called It's called CFF Convert, because it's also a conversion tool. But it's been put into a GitHub action that is available in GitHub. So the answer is yes and yes. You can validate. And yes, you can use a GitHub action. I will read the documentation better next time. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So the next question is uh, regarding validity. You did a survey of validity. Um, and the idea that has DOI is hard to achieve when you have to create your CFF files before you push to Zenodo. That generates a DOI that then isn't in the CFF file. So is this something that Hermes fixes for us? Yes, you, actually, you don't need Hermes to fix this for you. Um, it needs an extra couple of steps. You can go to a, a repository. Hopefully, your repository supports this. But Zenodo does support it. You can reserve a DOI. Put the DOI in the CFF file and make sure you kind of circumvent the chicken egg problem. But Hermes will fix this for you as well. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a general. There is also a CFF um, tool called, oh, it's, 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 it's from the community, it's from Jürgen Sparks, my co author on this, uh, called Xeno Draft, which kind of helps you make this more automatically and writes back to the CFF file as well. Thank you. So another question from Anonymous. The main frustration I have with CFF, uh, with citation.cff, is that versions and DOIs need to be manually updated. Is there a GitHub action to automatically update them? Um, there is not yet. Um, it's probably in the scope of the Hermes project to provide something like this. But it should also be easy enough to do this yourself if you have, have ha ha had to have uh, created uh, DOIs on, on, from, from someplace in the first place. So again, it's reserving things, looking up the field in the CFF, updating the value, commit, push, etc. So um, yeah, there should be someone creating this. Like, doesn't have to be me, but it could be. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we have time for two more questions, maybe. So uh, how wrong is wrong? So for CFF files that are wrong, how many can GitHub still provide a bibtex citable string that you know you could put into a paper or something? I guess. Rob, <laughs> um, I think I think I think GitHub is pretty lax. So where is the where is the Ruby gem that does have the ability to validate? I don't think GitHub called that. I think and certainly the gem doesn't insist on it being a valid. Um, does this system being a valid CFF to do what it can? So <clears throat> I think it probably does as, as well as it can, we say. Yeah, I think the general idea behind that was also to um, go the furthest possible way to creating a string that is usable. Yeah. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I don't want to support definitely producing bib text and API strings from invalid, but if it happens to work, then Good luck. Yeah, I think. It, yeah, it, it was just more a question of, you know, those ones that were listed as wrong on your flowchart, how many that I guess you can... So there have, there have been some issues raised with GitHub that then get passed to me, which are, um, I've put a CFF file in and I'm not getting the widget. Yeah. And the response has always been, make sure it's not so broken that we can't fix something yeah. with it. So, so <laughs> GitHub will fail silently, because it's just a web. Yeah. Page really, it's yeah. not going to put big error messages all over. So yeah, if, if you're not seeing it, you probably made it too wrong. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the good thing is that people come to the citation of CFF GitHub uh, repository and just open an issue, and we can try and fix it. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we can continue that conversation over coffee. So let's thank Stefan again.